Good morning, Bardstown and Nelson County, and welcome to Bradford and Brooks. Jim Brooks and Margie Bradford with you on a very sunny, pleasant uh, Wednesday morning here in downtown Bardstown, if you can avoid the traffic cones. <laughs> Good morning, Margie. Good morning, Jim. <clears throat> well, this weekend, we took my son back down to Western Kentucky University. Oh, boy. And um, or, 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 I, I guess there were a bit of mixed feelings. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... Uh, um, you're, glad, uh, you're, you're, you're glad to have him home for the summer, and you're glad to see him go. go see gone. him go in the fall. See him go in the fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, but uh, uh, he... Um, he worked for over the summer at Walmart, and uh, he actually enjoyed the work, and um, and especially the part about getting paid. So well, uh, yeah, that that sweetens the pot considerably. Yeah. <laughs> well, he uh, uh, he does he did jobs for oh dad, yeah. you know, and, and even some stuff for the Gazette, and uh, I don't pay the same scale that Walmart does. So <laughs> I guess I need to up my game a little bit. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, but there are there are uh, good things you. Don't like room and board. Well, that, yeah, that uh, I've all, I, I used to threaten him, you know, with a cardboard box, you know, if he didn't get his button gear. But uh, anyway, of course, he's he's finishing up a computer science degree, so uh, he'll uh, he'll. Uh, we're just hoping he'll stay within a drive's distance, you know, when he gets okay. done. Uh, but uh, it was... Uh, it, if he gets hungry enough, he'll come home. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to be on campus again. That's where I went to journalism school and uh, brought back a lot of memories. Of course, the buildings I used to use are were torn down years ago so uh and lots of new buildings but uh anyway <clears throat> the uh he was at a dorm i was familiar with i didn't live in it but um, had friends that did so anyway that um, that's kind of the continuing cycle of life i i realized that uh, you know these young people are just you know on the start of the their continuum their life and i don't know if they understand what what uh, what it means and how I don't know. I just hope they all take advantage of, of an, an opportunity for education and uh, keep the partying to a uh, to a reasonable level. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. anyway, well, enough about my pontificating. Uh, we have a very special studio guest with us uh, this morning on Bradford and Brooks, and uh, Allison Roby, a pharmacist, longtime pharmacist, and at uh, Medica Pharmacy. And um, uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Allison. Well, thanks for having me. A longtime pharmacist makes me feel <coughs> old. I wasn't sure I was ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I did just turn fifty this year, so yeah. I've been and I've been out there for a while. <laughs> Half a century I've been around. <laughs> well, the, uh, um, I used to, my, my wife's a physical therapist, has been for, well, let's see, almost 40 years. And uh, I usually refer to her, um, uh, people, you know, she's, you know, changed jobs and uh, HR folks will say, well, you've got a lot of experience. And I, so I call her seasoned, seasoned <laughs> therapist rather than, rather than say, you're old, you know, because well. I'm older than she is. But, uh, but anyway, you know, age has its benefits and experience, too. It's oh, yes. very important. Well, anyway, Allison, um, uh, as I told you before the show, uh, I, uh, I kind of asked you on for selfish reasons. Uh, I'm one of the many people that um, you know it was earlier this year where uh, was prescribed a uh, uh, what's called a GLP-1 and that stands for a name I cannot pronounce uh, but it's um, one of the many weight loss or well, weight diabetic slash weight loss medicines like Monjarno, um, Ozempic uh, and I can't remember all we, the other trade we, names. Wegovy is one. Wegovy, yeah. Sixenda, Zepbound, Trulicity. Right well and I guess it really, it, I, I, to me, it felt like it was early this year, but uh, some of these meds have been in short supply going back more than a year, I think, is what I've, what I've read anyway. Uh, but uh, And that shortage caught up with me, and I, after a couple of months, I couldn't find my uh, prescribed medicine and uh, did some searching online, and suddenly... There's all these online pharmacies that will promise you, uh, promise you a a uh, compounded replacement uh, for a fee, of course, and uh, they don't want insurance, so you're paying cash. Um, but you know, you're the uh, I, I actually signed up for a couple, 
and uh, it was clear to me that you know I'm I'm a guy with diabetes and take diabetic diabetes meds and it was clear to me that they wanted they're really looking for the these online pharmacies looking for the low hanging fruit the easy cases the ones where it's uh, where their main intent is losing weight and, and I don't fault them for that but uh, it didn't help me find it, my medicine I was looking for. But it, it did serve as an education. And, and I realized, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's uh, out there, <coughs> pardon me, in Nelson County, uh, trying to find a source. So that's why I invited you on, Allison, to talk about GLP-1s and, um, um, and th their availability. And, uh, you know, I've heard so many different stories about why there are shortages. Uh, but I guess it's just part of it is uh, probably a big part of it is just their popularity for those who wish to lose weight. Correct. And, and a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of those drugs and GLP stands for gluc glucagon like peptide. Okay. And so there, there's your answer on that one. But I'm a fan of them if they're going to help you manage your diabetes and if you need to lose weight. What we see in pharmacy land is, one, there's a lot of people that want to use them because they want to lose 10 or 15 pounds. Right. We also see that they are very expensive. And as I was explaining to you guys, people think you come in and you have a $100 copay. So a lot of people's miss conception of pharmacy is that pharmacies are just bringing in the money mm -hmm. and so f these drugs that cost anywhere from 900 to 1700 dollars we're lucky if we get paid enough to cover the cost of buying them at all i think the m big and I'm, this is me being 100 percent transparent i think the biggest profit that i have made on one of these drugs is 16 dollars and 75 cents and that's me spending 1700 dollars to make sixteen dollars and seventy five cents mm. well it doesn't matter if the drug costs you five dollars or costs two thousand it costs a pharmacy about twelve dollars and forty cents to fill a prescription so that's paying your people mm -hmm. your electric bills your vials your labels whatever it takes to fill that prescription well if i'm making sixteen seventy five then i really only made about four dollars so you know that's not a very good profit when you have a two thousand dollar drug so, um, there is a supply and demand problem. Everybody wants them. There is a manufacturing shortage. So, some of the drugs are out of the shortage. Some of the strengths are out of the shortage. Not all of them. So, it's hit or miss. Like, you, the, one of the GLPs is marked as possibly off the FDA shortage list, but it hasn't actually been lifted yet. Mm. Semaglutad, which is the more popular of the two and the least expensive of the two, is still listed as a shortage drug. And mm. so, yes, it can be compounded, and that's why people are advertising. You can only compound a drug that is commercially available if it's unavailable. Mm. Otherwise, it has to be in a different strength or a different dosage form to legally be compounded. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, um, hormones. I can compound all kinds of hormones because people need a variety of doses and a variety of dosage forms. Estrogens by mouth are never good for you, so topical estrogen is preferred, but topical patches only come in certain strengths, and so if you need a lesser strength, then it would need to be compounded. Mm -hmm. So then I'm able to do that, and I'm also I'm putting it in a cream, not a patch. Right. So um, that's why those drugs can be compounded right now is because they are in short supply and they're unavailable, which then gives certain pharmacies the ability and the legal right to compound them. Okay. All right. Um, you know, and I know that um, the popularity for weight loss is, is uh, well known, but the uh, um, and and I kind of experienced the same thing, you know. They they will help you lose weight, um, you know. And you do feel uh, it's pretty amazing the impact, you know, per, personally that you know you you, uh, you you're net not as hungry as you used to be. And and in my case, I had to make sure I didn't go too long without eating, um, eating something. Uh, and I had to, I w had to I watched what I ate to make sure it wasn't just a you know a uh, a little Debbie cake, you know, or something. Mm -hmm. I was trying to trying to make sure I was eating some quality food and staying away from fast food. Um, but the uh, and and you hit on this before the show, uh, and I lost 35 pounds, but um, I have put on since since then 25 of it back. Correct. Um, and that points exactly to what you were saying about weight loss. It's not just about the the medicine, the drug. It'll help you lose it, but there's a whole you know, you have to really look at your whole lifestyle 
and eating habits to really keep any weight you lose off. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And so part of the issue with it is is you have to be really careful with these drugs. They're effective. You're going to lose 12 to 14 percent of weight from the where you start on mm -hmm. for the average person. And, and granted, that's going to take you a year. Mm -hmm. Most people, it's 12 to 24 months to see that kind of weight loss. But when you're losing the weight, if you're not real careful, you're going to lose your muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And if you lose muscle mass, one, it becomes harder to lose weight. But two, muscle mass actually burns more fuel than fat cells do to an extent. And if you're not eating enough protein, you're not going to maintain your muscle mass. Mm -hmm. And so if your ability to eat food is limited and you're not hungry, then you maybe aren't going to eat as much protein. Right. So ideally, your lean body mass, you should be eating about seven-tenths of a gram of protein per lean pound. And so whatever your ideal body mass is and your ideal lean mass is, you'd want to multiply that by 0. 0.7. You can go as much as a full gram. It's mm -hmm. easier. We all know that's easier math, right? <laughs> so, you know, to give you an idea of how much protein you need. Right. And so that's what I think people don't understand is most people if you don't make the lifestyle changes you're going to gain every pound you lost back and you might gain more I actually know a lady who lost 50 she came off of it she gained back 60 mm -hmm. so that that's not good for anybody and sadly I always joke that penicillin was the worst thing and the best thing that happened to this country because penicillin we give it to you you treat an infection you live instead of die well now everybody wants to take a pill Nobody wants to do the hard thing, and I'm gonna, I don't want to harp on big food and big dairy because mm -hmm. I have a lot of good dairy farmer friends, and I, and I love my dairy farmers, but we are not cows, and we don't need milk, and we don't need all the processed stuff. If you walk into a grocery store now, most of what's in there you shouldn't be eating. That's all of us. You need to eat real foods. And so the obesity, the diabetes, the high cholesterol, the cardiovascular disease, which is still the number one killer of people, really can be prevented by what we eat mm -hmm. and what we eat alone. Like food is so much more, yes, exercise is important. You want to stress your heart and stress your lungs to keep them working at full capacity. But the most important thing is food. And when these drugs take away your appetite, and for some people cause severe nausea, sometimes mm -hmm. diarrhea, sometimes pancreatitis, and that happens more often at the higher doses and so sometimes people try to power through don't do that go to the lower dose stay on the lower dose if the bigger doses make you nauseous and miserable please don't take those back your dose down and work your way slowly up but you have to make the right choices or you're not going to be successful in the long term and these drugs are showing to lower cholesterol and lower um, blood pressure and you know obviously if you lose weight you're going to lose lower your blood pressure usually mm -hmm. but let's keep it that way our our healthcare system is so about to bankrupt us because of we talked about insurance companies mm -hmm. and big pharma not your independent pharmacies not your local pharmacies but big drug companies and insurance companies but most of our chronic diseases that are bankrupting us are preventable and it all starts with the food we eat well the um uh, of course, in my case, it wasn't weight loss I was after. It was uh, um, the uh, diabetes. And I will tell you that for that period I was on it, uh, my A1C was probably the best it's ever been because, you know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that's, uh, that kind of forgets diabetes when I take the kids out for ice cream, you know. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, that happens, doesn't it? <laughs> I forgot I had diabetes. It does. Well, listen, I mean, look, you put me in front of a Grater's ice cream store, and I'm going to eat ice cream, too. Oh, okay, so oh, <laughs> I get it. Oh, my God. You're right. It, the, I know, but these drugs are wonderful drugs. I have seen, personally, no diabetics whose A1C has come down one and a half, sometimes two points. I mean, amazing. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And we all know that elevated, chronic elevated blood sugar is horrible it plaques your arteries up it you know you vision kidneys i mean all the things it does mm -hmm. so many terrible things so yes it's a wonderful it's a wonderful class of drugs i'm not saying don't take them mm -hmm. you know they are amazing for diabetics the yes they're going to help you lose weight i just want people to do the right thing and work on their lifestyle while they're losing that weight because you you, can't, you don't ever for me you don't ever want to be on a drug forever unless you have to yeah. right. right you know so yeah. Go ahead, Marcia. How do these uh, drugs work? I mean, what makes them do what they do? So they, they slow down the rate that your stomach empties, and they mm -hmm. decrease your appetite. So you, if, so it's physiological. It takes about 20 minutes for an average person to know that they're full. Mm 
which mm. is why we tell people if you want to lose weight like eat chew slowly. your food really really well yeah. take smaller bites eat slower because then you realize you're full faster yeah. <laughs> so what these drugs do is you get full faster mm. they also delay how your stomach empties so if you're on a GLP drug and you're going to have to have surgery you have to be careful because we have seen incidences where long after your stomach should be empty mm -hmm. it is not and when food sits in your stomach too long it can actually irritate your stomach lining and cause ulcerations and micro bleeds and then it's a whole host of issues so you got to be careful with what you're eating on these drugs anyway but there's two hormones that control appetite and hunger mm -hmm. and ability to lose weight ghrelin and leptin and they're inadvertently affected and that's a that's a long conversation of <laughs> microbiology and physiology, so we won't start there today. But they do alter those two drugs. Garolin is the one that makes you feel full. If you become leptin resistant, you're more prone to gain weight. Almost every antihistamine out there, if you're at, and we live in the allergy capital, right? Mm -hmm. Almost every antihistamine out there can make you leptin resistant and make it harder for you to lose weight. So now, is there. that the resistance permanent, or is it just while you're using the antihistamine? So there's uh, lots of other things that can cause it too, yeah. but yeah. you can alter hormone sensitivities and resistances through lifestyle choices just about any time. Same goes for estrogen and testosterone. Now mm -hmm. there comes a point where you need hormone replacement, male or female, um, depending on the levels, but there are things you can do exercise-wise, diet-wise, sunshine-wise that will alter hormone levels. So there's lots of lots of ways to do it. It just takes work. And so sometimes people want to just take the pill or the shot right. and not, you know, we live busy. We live in a busy lifestyle and we know food is expensive. And I can't necessarily say it's more expensive to eat healthy because I know for a fact, I was saying I don't eat, I was telling you guys, I don't, I very rarely eat out. But if I'm hosting a party and I'm buying chips and cookies or whatever, I know that I spend way more money at the grocery store if I'm buying processed foods and if I'm buying fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So people think it's healthy to or expensive to eat healthy. And it, maybe it is, but I find the opposite. I find that I spend way more money if I'm buying mm -hmm. stuff that's in a package than if I'm mm -hmm. buying fresh fruits and vegetables, especially if you meal plan and spread it all out. It, mm -hmm. I think you actually save money. Well, Allison, uh, this is just my observation. It seems like uh, with the GLPs that the that there really needs to be, the medicine is just one part of uh, the treatment the their needs you know I, I had no counseling about uh, the lifestyle changes you know I mean and of course in my case it wasn't for weight loss that's a happy side effect but uh, it was you know to to get my A1C uh, lower and keep it low uh, but um, but it's and uh, it, it's you know those things you just don't think about you know it's a medicine you take it and you have the the effect you want but you you know I never thought about what happens when you go off of it until I went off of it mm -hmm. and it's like man I'm hungry again you know but uh, and, and I've seen warnings a friend of mine has uh, gastro paresis mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's even a uh, uh, there's a there's a warning about it may cause that and that's kind of what what it does in effect isn't it it kind of right. just instead of stopping everything just slows down your your digestion and stomach processes correct right and so yeah gastroparesis is a, is a side effect and gastroparesis is is terrible if you can't get it to go away you know and there are things you can do to get it to go away mm -hmm. but um but yeah so i mean like i said they're great drugs um very promising but no, nothing drug wise is without risk Right. Even a even a baby aspirin for, you know, a prevention can, has a risk of you know little ulcerations or microbleeds, and so everything has a risk. And so you, but you have to make sure you're incorporating those lifestyle changes at, at the same time, or you won't be successful long term. Right, right. And just a a, a quick story, the um, you do have to be careful about what you take, even with over counter over the counter meds. Uh, I was in a high stressful journalism job years ago, and uh, I made. I had a steady diet to pep Pepto Bismol tablets, oh, <laughs> and I ended up with a uh, stomach bleed, mm -hmm. and uh, spent uh, almost a week in the hospital, um, and in law and really, um, and and you know you know you're in trouble when uh, the night nurse yells down the hallway from your door to the other nurse, uh, I can't get a blood pressure on Mr. Brooks. Can you come down and help me? You know, and I called my wife and I said, call the doctor. I think I'm dying. You know, I mean, I felt that bad, too. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, even an over-the-counter med that's way overused 
you know, can really have serious imp- impacts on your health. Oh, even Tylenol at normal doses mm-hmm. can kill people because they have other issues that keep them from metabolizing it correctly, or they, or they drank way too much alcohol the day before or mm-hmm. during it, and so alcohol takes up all the ability to metabolize Tylenol because they work through the same metabolic pathways. And so if you drink a lot and then you take Tylenol for your hangover, you're actually at risk for an overdose. Mm-hmm. So really? Tylenol kills many people every year, and yet it's been over the counter for. As long as I as long as I can remember, right? right. I think since I was right. a little girl. Right. So yeah, so everything has a risk, and uh, you got to be careful. All right. Uh, well, Allison, we need to take a commercial break, get some messages in. Uh, you're listening to Bradford and Brooks and our very special guest, Allison Roby, uh, pharmacist at uh, Medical Pharmacy. And uh, we will be back in just a moment after these messages. So stay tuned, and we'll catch you on the other side of the break. All right, you're back with Bradford and Brooks here on WBRT 1320 AM 97.1 FM. And uh, this is Bradford and Brooks, Jim and Margie, and our very special studio guest, Allison Roby, a pharmacist at uh, Medica Pharmacy, who's been, we've been talking about uh, GLP-1s, uh, uh, the abbreviation for a name I can't pronounce, but it, uh, they're the, uh, the well-known uh, weight, diabetic and weight loss um, drugs that are, have been in short supply for, uh, depending on who you ask, uh, over nearly two years, but uh, depending on the medicine and, and dosage, I guess. Uh, but the, uh, uh, you know, some are, some companies are saying that it's easing, um, and then of course, if thanks to the shortage, we see. You know, I'm bomb- bombarded daily on Instagram and Facebook with with online pharmacies who are promising to provide it, uh, but you know, and they want you to pay cash, and um, you have to pay a fee to to actually be evaluated. And I've done it twice and was denied because I my my medical case was too complicated. And I'm actually thankful they did that because they're they're looking they're looking to make money by selling it to the low hanging fruit to the people who who are really interested in using it for weight loss. Um, and my, of course, being diabetic, my health care is more complicated. And uh, their advice was good because they said, you really need to be working with your doctor uh, on managing this and not through us. So they, they, they did me a favor, really, uh, by making, keeping my care local is where it should be anyway. All right. Um, well, Allison, I know that... Um, for a long time, and I don't know how many years it goes back, Medica has uh, been a pharmacy that compounds. And, uh, mm-hmm. and if you hear, and people may not understand what that is, there are uh, some of the online pharmacies promise uh, are selling a, uh, a compounded version of these medications. But what, what, tell us the story about compounding and, and how, you know, and obviously it's a it's a service you guys can do what um, when does it come in handy and um, you know what's uh, uh, what what does it actually allow a pharmacy to do so compounding is creating an individualized dose or dosage form for a patient in need and so we've actually compounded for through our existence back when my dad first opened as Bardstown Apothecary down on the mm-hmm. other corner where we were mm-hmm. and then became a medicine shop and then when our franchise was up we you know are sh- solely independent as Medica so my dad has always compounded and then over the years compounding got a little more intense and so mm-hmm. mo- most of us have been through some compounding training so um, hormones is a huge deal right is you get hormone dosing should be specific we don't have a lot of people in our area that specializes in women or men's hormones Mm -hmm. and what i see is that hormones are given at way too high a doses and much too quickly and hormones in the right dose will make you feel wonderful hormones balanced are anti-aging for men and women but if you give somebody too much then you're going to cause more problems than the deficiency they had to begin with so hormones is a great thing that you can do because you can really tinker with the dose and get it micro dosing bigger doses um, children especially we have you know quite a few kiddos that are born with heart defects and various issues that you know they cannot swallow pills they cannot take adult doses obviously mm. um, they need to be made into a liquid 
animals. I mean, if you've ever tried to get a cat to swallow a pill, I mean, we are your friends because most of these, <laughs> most of these things with cats, depending on what you're doing, you can actually make it into a transdermal gel that you rub in your cat's ears. Well, if your cat wants to have his ear rubbed, you just, oh, let me give you your medicine and you alternate the ears and get the medicine in. And if it has to be oral, you can make like triple fish flavor. And so it's, you know, good for animals. <laughs> it's good for babies. It's good for elderly. It's good for people that have G tubes or, you mm -hmm. know, um, other issues that they can't swallow or the commercially available product has dyes or fillers they're allergic to so there's a lot of opportunities and then when there are drug shortages you can compound I mean a few years back you couldn't get Tamiflu liquid at all and then I guess it was just last year and um, Chandler's working for me today he would remember because he was a student with me when you couldn't get amoxicillin suspension so we compounded amoxicillin suspension from the capsules which was a real pain it was not an easy process you would think oh you just open the capsules nope you got to grind up all the little granules in there and make it smooth and consistency so compounding can be super easy and it can also be very complex so, but it's really great when you have drug shortages. So the GLPs mm -hmm. can be compounded. So this is where it's important for people to understand a difference. If you're getting an injection, that's sterile compounding. I do not do sterile compounding. I do stuff that you can take by mouth. You can take it rectally, vaginally, in your ears or on your skin. Eyes we don't do because that's sterile and injections we don't do. Mm -hmm. You, we are con what is considered a 503A pharmacy. That means that I am regulated by the State Board of Pharmacy in anything I compound. That means I don't have to test the products that I make. We choose to test certain products. As I was telling you, I'm not going to test a magic mouthwash because you're going to swish it and spit it out. Mm -hmm. And if there's a milliliter less of lidocaine, it, you're going to be okay. But if we're making thyroid medications, which is very specific and has a narrow window of therapeutic index, then you need to test those products but it has to be patient specific so I can't just sell anything I compound to another doctor's office um, it has to be for a specific <coughs> patient mm -hmm. and so there's also a 503 B pharmacy now 503 B pharmacies are actually registered as manufacturers with the FDA so they're overseen by the FDA and the FDA actually will pull their products to test for them mm -hmm. and so they're much more strenuously um, regulated and tested and so when you're dealing with the GLPs you can use a 503A you want to make sure that you that they test their products and they follow all of the procedures they should be following so you have to do a little bit of research because years ago you may remember that there was a pharmacy and a compounding pharmacy that compounded an injectable steroid and it caused a host of meningitis issues all oh, over the I remember that. Well, they got all compounding pharmacies in trouble because they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing. They didn't follow the quality measures. They didn't have good manufacturing practices. They weren't clean enough. I mean, no. they were never yeah. inspected. And so they got away with a lot of things they shouldn't have. So with a 503B, though, they do have to follow all these more strenuous uh, processes. So the GLP drugs that we are now able to offer to people are from a 503B pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So I can buy the GLP compounded from a 503B, which is what we are doing. I have to dispense it to a patient via prescription. Mm -hmm. I prefer to have a doctor that I know in town mm -hmm. and a patient that I know. I don't want some random person that happens to swing through. I'm not going to fill your GLP drug if you live in Iowa and you happen to be here on business. I'm not going to do that. So, you know, we have to have a relationship. In my view, the perfect triangle is the doctor, the pharmacy, and the patient mm -hmm. all working together to improve mm -hmm. that patient's health outcomes. So we can get them, but you want to do your vetting. So if these online pharmacies, if you don't know if they're a 503A or a 503B, you don't know what quality measures they're following. And when you're dealing with a sterile injection, you want to be careful. Well, that, that was going to be one of my next questions. The, uh, you know, they're, they're just touting the availability of the GLP, and you really don't you know, there, there are some nameless entity, you know, with a nice looking banner ad. And, uh, and, and I will tell you, I mean, when I did it, I felt, I felt that I was being scammed in a way because I thought, well, this can't be this easy, you know. And I mean, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm Buy me, buy me. I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I can get that on, on Amazon or, or a, from a seller I'm more familiar with.
you know and um, uh, so yeah I've been real skeptical of of these of these providers uh, and of course they're they're out there to make money and and uh, I know that the two I signed up for well the only thing I lost was the was the fee to sign up with them you know they got that from me and then said they couldn't couldn't provide the med which I understand but the um, uh, but but again I mean I don't think I'm not sure how you would find out you know about their quality measures I mean it's it, they're really not dispenses you know they're dispensing the med and trying to meet that need that and not you know they're not promoting uh, their quality you know what I mean right correct and you should be able to ask the question but now and I'm I'll be I shop online too but I've obviously never shopped at an online pharmacy <laughs> why would I do that but um, I, I you would think that if you can actually get a body on the phone they should be able to answer that question are you a 503A as an alpha or a 503B as in bravo mm -hmm. if they can't answer that for you you need to hang up the phone I mean, that, if they don't know what they are, then that's that's a sign that maybe you don't need to do business with them. Right. Right. So the the 503B pharmacy that we buy from mm -hmm. actually has been, obviously they're an FDA approved. And so FDA approved 503Bs are allowed to manufacture drugs when there are drug shortages, as I said. But this one has been vetted by some very well-known independent pharmacists that I know. So they're... We have a group, and this is what I love about independent pharmacy, is we all work together and help each other. We're not, you know, out there like CVS and Walgreens battling mm -hmm. it out, trying to get the market share. Right. We actually want all of us to succeed. You know, the more independent pharmacies that are out there, the better health care we can provide to the patients in need. But there's a group of us that have a message board, and so there are a few pharmacists that are actually going to these 503B pharmacies, and they're actually pulling their records, they're vetting them out, they're mm -hmm. doing their research to make sure, like, are you really following your due diligence? When's the last mm -hmm. time the FDA inspected you? What's, where are your FDA reports? And so we know that the company that we're going to buy our GLPs from has been thoroughly vetted by the FDA and by a few other pharmacists that mm -hmm. specialize in this. And so we feel very comfortable that what we order for you is going to be a quality product. We also know that everything has a recall once in a blue moon. We also know that we, if they happen to have a recall, they will immediately notify any of us that purchased anything. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood, the one we're buying from hasn't had any recalls yet, so we're going to keep our fingers crossed because they are very well known. They have a very good reputation um, across the independent pharmacy landscape of being a very well-run um, 503B for, um, compounding pharmacy. Uh, Allison, I would read something about one of the difficulties in uh, trusting, uh, uh, you know, what you're getting from a compounding pharmacy had to do with uh, being able to translate the, the, I guess, the percentage of the drug? Correct. So, yeah, yeah so the, that... You know, that, that if you're if it's if it's this much in this how much is it is in this yeah, there's a lot of math involved um, right. in compounding pharmacy and so you're there's a couple of ways you can compound so you talked about the GLP compounded being a cash only thing mm -hmm. the vast majority of insurance companies anymore will only pay for a compound if it's made with a commercially available ingredient so um, one of the GLPs that nobody really talks about is Ribelsis, which is a mm -hmm. tablet okay and it's in different right. strengths because it's you can compound that. However, once you break that, crush that little tablet up and you put it in a sublingual film or a trochee or a sublingual drop, the other ingredients you use, the insurance isn't going to pay for. They might pay for the ribelsis, but they don't pay for the other things. Hmm. And so... <clears throat> That's why it's cash. So you have to take a formula, whether you're using the compounded ingredient, a commercially available tablet or capsule or other liquid, or the powder form. And you can measure it out and weigh it out. So there's always a formula. We work uh, with Professional Compounding Centers of America. They're kind of the gold standard of compounding companies. There's many other very good companies out there that we also work <clears throat> with. What I love about them is that if we have a brand new formula, they have all kinds of formulas on their website. If we have a brand new formula, I can put in a phone call and say, hey, I've got this new formula we're working on. Can you have somebody double check my math? <laughs> and they will double check your math. And so a good compounding pharmacy, I am very good at math. But if I'm messing with something that's intricate and there's multiple steps in the math involved, do I think it's a good idea for someone else to double check me? Absolutely I do. Mm -hmm. And I, it's, so if I fill a prescription, I don't want to be the final pharmacist verification either. I'm going to send it to my other pharmacist and go, I entered this and did this. Mm -hmm. I need your set of eyes on it. Right. Because we were told in pharmacy school, if we were 
99.9% accurate in everything we did that we would probably still kill one or two people in our lives. That's how important pharmacy mm -hmm. is. And 85% of med errors are found when the <clears throat> pharmacist talks to the patient, which is why you people out there need to talk to your pharmacist. Demand to ask questions because sometimes we fill the prescriptions correctly, but your, your doctor picked the wrong one from the drop-down menu, mm -hmm. right? So always ask, the at least ask that you got the right drug and what it's for. I mean, I was dispensing a a medicine to a patient and she thought it was for restless legs and the drug that was sent to me to my pharmacy was an antipsychotic. Two totally different things. Had I not mm -hmm. counseled her, she'd have got the wrong medicine. Wow. So with compounding, you got to double check. You got to do the formula. Um, it, it is strategic, but it, there's, you know, it's like if you do enough math, you know that you can do mm -hmm. it backwards and if you get it, come mm -hmm. up with the same number. So there's right. a, we have a whole method of calculating when you make capsules from scratch there's actually a way that once you're done with the capsules you weigh the capsules divide them out to make sure that they have the right amount of powder mm -hmm. of total active ingredient inactive ingredient so there's a lot of ways to double check yourself and then of course you can do third-party testing where you'll send a sample of something you compounded mm -hmm. out to a third-party lab that has nothing to do with your business and they're going to test it and go this is what is in it what's your accuracy and how that you did that. And like I said, we don't do that with every single drug, but there are drugs that you should be testing to make sure that you're making them correctly. Well, Allison, we talked, uh, touched on this briefly. <coughs> Pardon me. My, uh, uh, my insurance uh, either requires or strongly urges us to use our, our um, their mail-in pharmacy for our for maintenance meds, and of course, being a diabetic, and uh, I, I have you know several diabetes maintenance meds, and so I think their policy had been they only they will pay for like up to three months from a local pharmacy, and then you're required to go through mail order. Uh, and I think you, you made a reference that there's some, uh, there is a change or a change has been made or a change is coming uh, related to that because, you know, I was, I, I had been using a local pharmacy forever. And then, you know, and because you, you do have uh, the, the advantage of local counseling and you know very seldom did I go in especially if it was a new med that I didn't have a conversation with a pharmacist mm -hmm. and uh, you know when it's coming from <coughs> Pennsylvania in a, a UPS box you know you don't have that you know and and I really miss that and I, I really don't like that requirement but uh, you were telling me that has something in that order changed now so we have a law that we passed um, this year and I was really sad that we couldn't get an emergency order to put it into effect in July instead of mm -hmm. January but it is supposed to take away the mandatory mail order thing now mm -hmm. I will say that a lot of insurances will send out that you can get three and then you have to use mail order right sometimes you can opt out of that and they don't make it easy for you to do that and they may, everything they send you makes you think you can't but mm. there are a lot of them that you can call and go I'm sorry I'm not going to use mail order I have a family member that deals with this regularly I'm going to use my local independent pharmacy I do not want to use mail order sometimes they'll let you and sometimes they won't and that for me has always been wrong we're supposed to live in a free country of choice mm -hmm. and, and you have zero choices in health care so in starting in January your mandatory mail order is supposed to be prohibited in the state mm -hmm. also there are a lot of people out there that said I would, I've had people say I'd love to come to you but I have to my copay is double or triple if I use you as opposed to using Walgreens or Walmart or, or whatever mm -hmm. that is also supposed to be off the table um, they're also targeting insurance reimbursement I think what people don't understand they're like well why do I have to pay ten dollars at your pharmacy but if I use mail order I get it for free well they pay themselves much better than they pay <laughs> us and so you know there's uh, representative Coomer, uh, Comer, Coomer, Comer. Thank you. <laughs> I was like Lebanon, you know, blonde. Um, he, th they had a big meeting with all the insurance companies recently, and to be fair, finally our federal representatives and senators were just tearing them apart about the corruption in the in healthcare and the insurance companies being to blame for most of it. So that law is supposed to target a lot of it. The problem lies in is that you have state insurances and then you have federal Medicare D and mm -hmm. the Medicare D will say, well, we are federally funded. We don't have to abide by state laws. Right. So there's still a lot of changes that need to happen in health care. But for the most people with private insurances, starting in January, your copay should be the same regardless of where you go and you shouldn't be forced to use mail order. This is one of the hottest summers that I remember us having. I mean, it's been hot it and is. humid. It is. And I'm sorry, but mailing medicines in this heat is not ideal storage for prescription drugs. Well, you know, I, I get sent a, a three-month supply of insulin, 
and so you know it's packed with with ice uh, you know ice bags and and styrofoam and everything and the last I got one recently during the when the heat was really bad and it was still cool inside but every ice pack was thawed you know, and, and then and think I, of the environmental, you know, you got styrofoam right. and ice packs and all this right. stuff that you got to throw in the trash. And that's not environmentally friendly either. And I'm, I don't care where you are politically, but I'm a big fan of protecting our planet. <laughs> so, you know. Well, we, well you know. we do have to live here. So we yeah. do. We do. And I, hopefully well, my children will get to live here too. So, yeah. you know, I don't like to put stuff in the landfill, but I do. And I wish we would recycle better in this town, but that's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. yeah, another day. <laughs> one, one last question. We're just about out of time. Uh, and this came up, this question came up. Uh, years ago, and probably not long after the Nelson County Gazette began posting jail logs, and somebody had a question on Facebook, and I believe you were you were answer, you answered it um, or, or weighed in on it that uh, about the charge of uh, being charged with carrying prescription drugs drugs without a not in a proper container. Mm-hmm. And I think at that time you you um, you said well you know that you could offer. Um, I don't know, from the pharmacy, you could put group meds together in a legal way yes. that wouldn't have to have the, the bottle with the prescription on it. Correct. All right. Is that still something available? It is. And I'll tell you, like, I take it. We talked about supplements. I don't, I don't really take any pre- prescriptions. I take a lot of supplements. And when you travel, if anybody, and we should all travel, go travel. It's great. Yeah. Nobody wants to carry around 10 bottles. Right. And then you can't, I mean, the amount of people that will call me and go, I know that my medicine's early, but I left it in the cabin in the middle of Denver. You know, they mm-hmm. left it in the hotel room. <clears throat> so we do offer medicine packaging. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great for people that just can't remember. Um, it's good for anybody, honestly. It's good for kids that are split in homes. If you're at oh. your mom's certain day and your dad's certain that's the other thing. Oh, my gosh, my, we left all my kids' medicine at dad's house, and he lives two hours away. Mm-hmm. Well, if you have a package and your kid's going to your dad's for three days, you just tear off the Friday, Saturday, Sunday doses and send them with your child, mm-hmm. and you have the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, you can send it to school that way. So, yes, there's packages, and then there's pill cards. So there are a couple different ways we can package medicines, but it's it's great because that way if you have medicines you got to take in the middle of the day, you just have one or two little packages depending on how many pills you take that you can put in your purse or Mm -hmm. um, take with you to work or school or you know whatever so med packaging is amazing um, and there are people that you know you can't drive if you're a med packaging patient for us um, we proactively do everything for you we will deliver your medicines to you Um, so it's you know people that have inability to drive or can't see well there's so many benefits to it Um, and some insurances will actually pay for your medicines to be packaged for you not all there's a couple but some of them will actually pay that fee for you and we don't we don't really charge a fee we probably should um, because as i was telling you it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet in pharmacy just Mm -hmm. google how many pharmacies have closed in the state of kentucky in the last year and you'll see Um, but med packaging is is wonderful for so many people all right well we're just we're out of time and allison thank you so much for coming in and sharing your knowledge and experience with us well thanks for having me it's been fun well, I, and uh, I think we've uh, helped educate our, our listeners at the WBRT audience. Well, we're out of time, and we'll be back next Wednesday with another Bradford and & Brooks, and we'll see you then. Until then, have a great week.